Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am honored to be joined by Earl Bennett to talk about the history of drum magazines. Earl, welcome to the podcast. Welcome, Bart. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, this is a cool one, man. Uh, it's so it's it's an interesting topic, um, which I'm excited to get into. But before we do that, before I forget, I want to mention uh, a friend of the show and many um, drum, you know, nuts all over. Uh, my friend, everyone's friend, Mr. Mark Cooper, has been kind of out of the uh, uh, the limelight for a little bit with his Cooper's Vintage Drums website. Uh, it went down. He had some health health issues, but Mark Cooper is back and you guys can check out his website vintagedrumhistory.com there's a ton of good stuff there uh mark was on the slingerland history which was in the first like 10 or 15 episodes wow. extremely knowledgeable guy um he is just uh super cool i'm glad he's feeling better and he his knowledge is back up on the internet so check out vintagedrumhistory.com um to see what he's doing there so anyway earl back to you um this is a neat one. You have a uh, you've made a very cool YouTube video that kind of started this whole thing. That was the history of drum magazines, 1970s to 2022. And it goes through uh, your history with these magazines, along with pretty much uh, and as far as I can tell, most of the magazines, if not all of the magazines in America, some overseas and you have great examples in that YouTube video. I'll link to it in the description. But today we are here, though, to talk about that and uh, and learn more about it. So without further ado, why don't we just jump in here and um, you can teach us what you know about the history of drum magazines? Well, great. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on, Bart. Sure. Um, I watch your show. I listen to your show faithfully. So thank you. And I remember that Slingerland one. That was a great, great one. Very, great, very knowledgeable guy. Great show. Yeah. I love Slingerland drums. And I think that's where drum magazines came in for me. You know, I, when I was a kid, I used to read catalogs. And the first catalogs I had was a Ludwig um, drum catalog from 1975 with the Vista Light kit. And I bought a Vista Light kit when I was a kid. And then I picked up the Slingerland catalog. That's my favorite drummer, Danny Serafin, played Slingerland drums. So drum catalogs led me to one day walking in the music store for my lesson in 1978. Uh, I was a senior in high school, and uh, there was an issue of Modern Drummer magazine on the uh, on the tabletop. And in doing that, um, basically what I, I found was Tony Williams on there, and I'd never heard of Tony Williams. And I said, wow, what's this? And they said, this is a new magazine. We, we're starting to carry it. You want to buy one? It was two bucks, so I bought one. And it just started it. And they came out quarterly at the time. And it was the beginning of me actually looking for drum magazines all the time. Whenever I would go in a music store, it was drum magazines. That's what I wanted to know. That's what I wanted to find. Um, I was constantly doing that. So that was that's really how it started. And that's really where it went for me. You know what I mean? That's awesome. So that was, um, yeah. Well, and, and so Modern Drummer, though, and, and I'm referring back to your video there. That was the you got the second year of it correct didn't it come out a year prior uh the actual magazine started one year before in like is it 77 it started in 1977 the first issue had buddy rich on the cover um and then it went from there i think um ron spagnardi who was the editor and publisher of modern drummer was a big jazz drummer guy you know what i mean so he and buddy was his guy um and he put buddy on the first issue and that was that was really cool but I don't think it had distribution at that point. They were trying to get distribution. And a matter of fact, I used to get a subscription to Downbeat magazine. My grandmother got me a subscription to Downbeat. And in the back of Downbeat, they were talking about this magazine, one of the issues I had. Hmm. And I didn't see it. You know, it was in the ad section in the very back. You know, if you want a drummer magazine, it was Modern Drummer. Because I, I think there was a guitar player magazine. That was one of the ones that came in the 70s. And I think guitar player had a couple other magazines. They eventually had a bass player and a keyboard player. And keyboard came out. I, I saw an ish interview with Robert Lamb, the drummer, uh, the uh, keyboardist for Chicago in 1979, and I have that issue of keyboard. So they were around right around the same time Modern Drummer came out. They started to bring in other instruments, but Guitar Player was the first solo instrument, you know, magazine sure. that I could tell. It yeah. goes way back to like 71, 72, 73. So they were GPI 
um, publications and they weren't doing drums. So Ron Spignardi jumped in and said, yeah, let's do this. And he did it. It was, it was so such a small magazine. I mean, they really didn't have readership yet. So it took them a couple, three or four years to get from quarterly to six times a year to eventually going every month. Hmm. I think that started like 1982-ish, somewhere around there. I was in college at the time. It seems very obvious um, to say this, but like it was a lot different than it is now, where magazines absolutely struggle to exist, which we will talk about later down the timeline. But this, this it was such a bigger deal, and it was more like that's your your gateway to your favorite drummers is to get your magazine, where... I mean, I was born in 90 and I remember as a kid um, in, I would say, starting in probably 2000, 2000 and and on for many years, I got every year at Christmas. It was a subscription to Modern Drummer. Things changed, but I I love that, like, you know, to to know that journey for them of like, uh, because you to be a magazine, you have to get sponsors. You have to do the interviews. It's a lot of work and you're probably not making a lot of money. So it makes sense. They had to kind of ramp up over time to get there. Yeah, and it, it and I think that magazine journalism was starting to become bigger and bigger, and it was starting to get niches. You know, this is before cable had niches, but right around the same time, I worked in the cable industry for years, so um, the cable television industry, and right around 1981 was when you had MTV show up, and that's when cable started to be, now there's more than four television networks, or three television networks, actually. There wasn't a fourth television network, main at the time. So I grew up with three TV channels and PBS and a couple independent channels. Well, we were starting to see now magazines were doing the same thing. They were diversifying just like TV channels would eventually diversify. So you have specialty niches, you know, so it wasn't just Life Magazine and Time Magazine. And I think Modern Drummer was the beginning in that early wave of music magazines that were now for certain niches. And drummers love catalogs drummers love looking at pictures of drums i know many drummers are. i mean that's all instagram is today right i mean instagram is nothing but drum you know looking at drummers you know flipping their drummers and what drum kit they got and back then that was the only place you'd see a different kit was either have a drum catalog from a manufacturer or to have a magazine and to see what the new thing that was coming out was yeah and i was all about the gear i was always a gear head i always I mean, I was the guy that in college, they would come to, can you fix my snare drum? Can you fix this? Can you fix that for me? Mm. What, what should I buy? What, what drum should I buy? Well, I was doing the research because I was reading all the magazines. You know what I mean? I was reading them. I was getting as much information out of them as I possibly could. I was learning about my favorite drummers this way, what they were into, what inspired them, what influenced them. Because there was no podcast. There was no YouTube. There was no internet. There was no Google. So this was where we got information and it was the beginning stages of it. So it's pretty cool. Very cool. You're right. Exactly. And, and I think, uh, you know, it, it had to be a point where, uh, gear, uh, manufacturers would probably realize, Oh wait, this is a direct way to reach our audience, which there's parallels there to podcasts and YouTube where, Oh wait, you know, uh, giant music store, I'll say Sweetwater cause they've sponsored the show in the past, but like, I see Sweetwater ads all the time on YouTube and it's like, it's, it's how you reach people now. I mean, it's the same as, uh, print ads in magazines, but I think it's changed, but anyway, let's, all right. So what happens then after modern drummer? Well, what happens is modern drummer starts to gain popularity and there's this other, this magazine for drums. And by about the mid eighties, some other drum magazines start to show up. And the earliest one being Drums and Drumming Magazine and a magazine called Rhythm. And I found them in the local music store that was in Red Bank, New Jersey, a place called Jack's Music. They had a copy of Rhythm Magazine. I was like, wow, what's this? It's another one. Let's buy it. So I bought it. And then I saw Drums and Drumming. And Drums and Drumming was done by the GPI publishers. So it was a guitar player publication at first. And Drums and Drumming, uh, at that time, it was coming out, I think, quarterly and then eventually it went to you know bi-monthly and everything else just like they all did at one point and they they all kind of came in and there was you know right there it was the beginning of like lots of information i think i don't know when nam started because i've never been to a nam show i've always wanted to go but i think nam was starting to be like one of the features in these 
magazines. You would always see around January, the, the first NAMM show of the year, you know, would be there and they'd be doing it probably in April or May. They'd put out, here are the, the new featured equipment at the NAMM show. So it's all that convergence of advertising, drum manufacturers, um, and now having a place to give it out to the professional musicians and the semi-professional musicians and the amateurs and the kids. And I think that's really what started to happen. So Rhythm Magazine was different. It came from the UK and the United States. Um, matter of fact, it does have a UK base. I've gone back and looked a little bit. So some of the information in my original um, discussion of it on YouTube, I got some clarity on some of these things. And eventually it goes out of business. It stops publishing. I think running a magazine is costly because, you know, print and color and, you know, paying for writers and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so that, that's, that's all part of it. Um, so rhythm lasted from like 1988. I dated to, to about September of 1990. That was the last issue. I remember that drums and drumming started somewhere probably around the 85, 86 ish, somewhere in there at that point. And then it lasted till probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 1990, 91. Hmm. And that's when it went under. The interesting thing about drums and drumming is drums and drumming leads to another magazine called drum magazine. And that's the one from California. And that's where the editor from drums and drumming ends up starting that other magazine. And drum is a interesting uh, discussion point too. Yeah. Well, so, let me ask then. So, uh, modern drummer, drums and drumming, rhythm. Were, was there any like differentiating factor between them? Like, I know drum was more of like a uh, younger California side of things, but was there a big something that s separated drums and drumming from modern drummer? Uh, was one more jazzy than the other? Was one more rock? You know, I think they were all going for the same guys, but. Um, you know, the rock musicians of the 80s were definitely featured in all those magazines. They all went for the, the rock musicians. Modern drummer always had that more stately um, jazz drummer kind of thing. Because Ron Spignardi was a big jazz drummer musician. He was a percussionist. Sure. He wasn't just a, a drummer. I don't know if he did Broadway or whatever, but knowing where he lived and the kind of musicians that lived up in North Jersey. Cause I grew up in Jersey. So okay. I've got a Jersey background too. And I went to college, Jersey city state college. And my um, teacher in college was a Broadway pit musician. So I kind of know that that scene up there, Sp Ron Spagnardi really knew some of the guys in that scene. Cause some of the early um, teaching um articles inside modern drummer were from guys like Roy Burns, who was a jazz drummer. There was a guy named Danny Patillo. I think his name was, he was a, a show drummer. So I think that was the differentiator. I think now we're in the middle eighties, MTV and what you saw in rhythm magazine was like a Phil Collins was on the cover. Um, you were getting more of the big name drummers were the first ones in. Of course, the studio musicians were always guys you'd find in the drum magazines, like Jeff Beccaro, um, John Robinson, Steve Gadd. Um, those were the guys. And those were the guys that inspired me, like seeing an article on Rick Murata and realizing, oh, I know this guy. I've seen this guy playing with James Taylor. You know, I saw him on Sesame Street playing with James Taylor. I was like, wow, this is that's yeah. that that's that guy he's the new york guy that plays a lot of all this stuff and i'm realizing his background and i started buying his records and realizing what a great drummer he was you know modern drummer did that for me and then these other magazines started filling that that void you know and getting me more exposure yeah and i do think there was a big change when the when it went to drum magazine and california drummers and the punk drummers they got way more press in drum than they did in modern drummer early on Early on, modern drummers stayed with that stately thing, you know, that yeah. stately drummer, the the drummers that are the working drummers and all that stuff, you know. But like you have to cover both sides of it where mm -hmm. uh, you have to and you and your video said a lot of times, you know, this is for the boomers and this is for this. But like you want you want the pop punk drummers and you the Travis Barkers to be on the cover. And it's funny because you held one up and you were like, 
Andrew Hurley on one. Like, well, I don't know what happened to that guy. He was a drummer in uh, Fallout Boy. So it's like yeah. these guys were, you know, no schlubs by any means. But it's just a different California, California vibe to the whole magazine. Yeah. And it, he was a guy I never heard of. You know what I yeah. mean? And when I got it. But when I found it, when I was in California doing business and I found that magazine and the first magazines of drum I found were newspapers. They look like newspapers. You'd find mm. them in music stores for free in a big pile. And, have, and there was like all these back issues. And I just grabbed like as many of the different ones as I can find and stuck them in my bag and left. You know, it was like yeah. product literature, you know, in the back in the day. I got a pro catalog and I got oh, <laughs> drum magazine. Okay. Yeah. You know? It was before they were, you know, charging for it because they were trying to get that. I think what happened was when drums and drumming ended, this guy, Andy, who was running the the magazine at the time, I think his name was Door, Sh- Door Chucker or Shucker. Sure. Door, Sh- Door Shucker. Um, he basically wanted to keep it going. And he used a lot of the same writers that write, were writing for drums and drumming started writing for drum. And that's where he took off. And he had, he found his niche. And he was actually running right alongside a modern drummer. So you got to give them credit for where they were and what they were doing. Yeah. And he defined his own style. And I think that's the difference. The modern drummer style was the long form journalism style of longer articles. So you had your established writers like Robin Flans and um, Bill Miller was a writer early on Bruce T. Wittett. Um, there was a whole bunch of these guys that wrote for the magazine back in the day. And they were the ones that, wrote this long form kind of journalism, longer articles. Drum started shortening the articles, making them shorter, more concise to the point, more. And it seemed like they were more selling whatever that product was of the month, like the album that was the, the drummer was pushing, you know, like, well, the drummer, we just, you just did an album. Let's talk about that album. Let's talk about some cuts. Let's talk about your equipment. And then we're out, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. So you can get more people in it too, by that, by the way, you know, sure. There's, there's no right or wrong. And I know uh, you had mentioned in your video that you are you love long form journalism. You you enjoy the long uh, articles. I guess obviously everyone says people from like my generation have no attention span. But I do I do see both sides of it where for me, like if I can actually sit down and like take the time and read a long article, it's great. But I also do like you know, crazy flashy colors of these, you know, new drummers coming up and uh, little blurbs and it's just little bites that you can uh, digest. I think there's room for both, you know? Oh, yeah. there And there was room for both at that p- point in time. Yeah. A matter of fact, there was so much room in the drum magazine world that when Jonathan Mover decided in 2007, I'm going to start another magazine, there was still room for it. But this was unfortunately going to be short lived because publishing in general was starting to lose something by the mid 2000s. And again, my wife was a journalist. My wife wrote for Modern Drum. I have to say this. This is part of what, what brings me to this whole thing because she was writing for newspapers early on in our marriage. It was one of the ways we would make a little extra money. I would work and do gigs and she would do gigs with me and she would write for newspapers. And she queried Modern Drummer to write an article for Modern Drummer. And that's how she started working for Modern Drummer. And wow. so I got a little bit more of the inside baseball publishing thing from her because what she was going through and she was writing for other magazines, like um, a magazine called Contemporary Christian Music, CCM. And she was one of the editors on that magazine for a while. And they were out of Nashville. And um, so I got to see publishing where it was going. And by the end of, you know, the century, so to speak, I guess it's the end of the I'm that old. I'm really that old. Uh, the end of the century, uh, things were changing. Yeah. And when you got to the 2000s, Time Magazine didn't know how to sell its magazine anymore. You know what I mean? And the New York Times didn't know where to, how to, how am I going to sell online? You know, and it's all about making money. Sure. You know what I mean? Until they've got the, the web presence and everything else. And, you know, we all saw this coming. I mean, when we, when you think about why magazines are no longer here anymore, you really have to look at CDs. Remember CDs, those of things, course. those little yeah. discs, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I used to record to want to be on a CD to get my name on, exactly. you know, those things, you, you know, you'd have to burn your disc and then put it in your car when you get done recording and, uh, right. and then you listen mix. to it. Yeah, yeah. I, I did all that. I, I mean, cause I've mixed albums and I have played on albums and stuff. 
Yeah. I mean, and there's nothing better than seeing your name on an album, you know, but today I'm on all kinds of Spotify stuff in the last year, but nobody would know it. You know, who's going to know about it? (laughs) Because there's no credits. Yeah. There's no credits. Yeah. So the world changed. But in 2013, they said, we're going digital. We're going to get rid of CDs. And if an artist puts out a CD, it's for themselves. Or if they put in an album, it's a vanity thing now. It's like, let's charge yeah. 40 bucks for a record. You know, a record. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me think of like, there's like parallels. To, there's that turn. There's like parallels to like uh, what came to mind immediately. I'm sure there's tons of drum examples, but like, like Kodak, where like companies like didn't pivot to digital and they disappear because they should have when they, when they, you know, could have and they suffered for it they didn't ride the wave which you know whatever they probably just didn't see it coming uh and magazines uh newspapers everyone always talks about how you know their local newspaper used to be this thick and now it's like a a little magazine kind of thing it's just a sign of the times but uh one thing worth mentioning too you talked about cds is how uh correct me if i'm wrong and i kind of remember this drum used to have a cd that would come with it right uh, it was actually Drumhead. Drumhead oh, drum was head. ahead. Drumhead was ahead of the time. In 2007, they would produce a CD with the with the magazine. They'd sell them in the music stores, and you'd buy it and bring it home. And you had all kinds of playing examples. One of the things all these magazines have, and I I, I, I tend to think I think about the articles. I think about the drummers in the magazines, so to speak. But in actuality, they were all teaching magazines. They always had articles about technique and about playing jazz, playing rock. And Drumhead was one of the better ones. I mean, Modern Drummer was great too early on. It was it was super cool. Nothing nothing like seeing how to mutate paradiddles and take George Stone's book, you know, stick yeah. control and do whatever you want to do to it. But um Drumhead was ahead of themselves when they added that C D to their magazine. And then eventually it went to online. Because it didn't make sense to, to send CDs and then mail them through the mail, you know, and yeah. half the time they get broken or something, <laughs> something would happen yeah. to them, you know? Well, now there's not even a disk drive on like, like my computer. It's like, I'll get school pictures from like my son's school and there's no, it's on a disk. And it's like, I don't, I have to take it to like my mom's computer and put it in. The, <laughs> it's like, there's no, so that's, that's gone. But I, I remember getting a Mojo magazine as a kid that had a CD and it was like Pink Floyd edition and it was awesome. And I listened to it. And it would be in my little binder of CDs and stuff like that. Like it is an important part of the history to, to kind of have that physical thing. Yeah. And it was a way to listen to new music and get exposed to new music, yeah. get exposed to drumless music. It, a lot of the times in with drumhead, it was drumless tracks. So you were, but I mean, I'll tell you what modern drummers version of that was because modern drummer was the, one of the first magazines to have a sound file in their magazine. Hmm. And I'll, I'll, I'll never forget the issue. The issue, I, I don't remember the issue of who was on the cover, but I remember what was in the issue. It was Jeff Picaro playing Peisty Cymbals, and it was on a little plastic record that oh. came in the middle of the magazine. You ripped it out, and you put it on your record player, and you listened to it, and it was all about him playing his Peisty 2002 Peisty Cymbals. Wow. And it was just a, a sound file. And I think there was a couple other examples of that, too, in Modern Drummer. So it was a record. So we went from records to CDs, you know, yeah. to Which, online. I'm sure the drum industry didn't invent that. Other magazines were probably doing that and sending out, you know, or, or in a box of cereal, you'd get a little record or something like that. I'm sure that's not a new thing. But um, so before we go too much further, let's talk about um, and cr- stop me if I'm getting ahead of myself, but I think it was in the 90s. Uh, not so modern drummer. Which is an important because on the timeline, I mean, that's kind of around where we are, correct? With John Aldridge and Not So Modern Drummer. Yeah, Not So Modern Drummer. I my exposure to that was again during my California trips. I ran into this magazine in a drum shop. One of the things I would do when I go on road trips for work was I would find a good place to eat, nice hotel, and where's the drum shop? <laughs> so yeah. if I was in town for a week, I'm gonna find forks. I'm gonna find whatever drum shops in town. And a lot of times the drum shops were the places you would find something like not, um, not so modern drummer, which was a magazine that was designed for collectors of vintage drums. That's what it was all about. And they had a little community and the community would basically trade and buy and sell in the back of the magazine. And then they would do articles on very old vintage gear. I mean, this is like, like forties and fifties vintage gear back in that day. 
in the 90s because the 70s drum kit was not vintage. Now today it is vintage, but back then it wasn't. Sure. So you were looking at K Zildjian cymbals or, you know, old A Zildjians or a, a Slingerland Radio King snare drum. And you learned Black all about or, yeah, Black yeah. Beauties, yeah. Um, all that good stuff. Yeah. So it, it was kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. And there's, um, I don't know a ton, but from doing so many interviews with Rob Cook and uh, John Aldridge, I had one. Uh, I would recommend that if people are interested in learning more about that, I think in John Aldridge's episode, which was about drum engraving, he, though, of course, he talked about Not So Modern Drummer and and how it was like, <laughs> I forget the story. I got to listen back to that about how uh, he would go to like his wife's job and like do the Xerox copy and like tape little things onto a piece of paper and then print it. And um, really fascinating story, uh, which it's kind of a that's kind of an underdog story, which now it's it's I believe George Lawrence uh, c- continues it. And it's a um, email newsletter that you can get that is full of great information. Um, so yeah. he went digital and has a huge um, subscriber ship. So it's kind of you know, he had to pivot, which you have to do. It, which is, again, it's all back into that mid 2000 teens. Everything started to pivot. Yeah. Because it became a world where if you didn't pivot, you were going to be in trouble, you know, eventually. And eventually Modern Drummer does get into trouble. And I know one day you'll talk to the, the current owner of Modern Drummer. So, yeah. and when you do that, he can tell you all about that, you know, how they've had a pivot, but yeah. Um, well, I appreciate you. Let me mention, cause I appreciate you teeing that up. Cause probably very soon after that, uh, today is the 30th of December in January 10th. I'm talking to David Frangioni, uh, just to get an update on modern drummer. We were talking, um, kind of through an email and was like, Hey, you should come back on the show. Cause he has been on before. Um, so people listening can look forward to that, um, and get a little bit more of an update on, um, what's up with modern drummer. Cause, uh, Earl and I both love the magazine and, uh, both of us grew up on it in different times. Um, so we, you know, it, it holds a very special place in everyone's heart. So look forward to that if you're a fan of Modern Drummer. But um, OK, so carry on from there. Well, I guess when I, let's go back to Modern Drummer. Modern Drummer did have another publication at one point in time. They had a magazine called Modern Percussionist. That's how much Ron Spagnardi loved percussion that he started a magazine on percussionists and mallet players. And there was like Dave Samuels was on the cover once. Lee Howard Stevens was on the cover once. These were classical. One was a jazz marimba player. One was a jazz classical marimba player, jazz vibraphonist. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, among other percussionists that they had, but that didn't have any traction. Didn't take off, you know? So we get through the eighties and it shakes down, you know, and now we still got modern drummer on the top. Um, and then we have drums starting to come up and then this other magazine shows up at my, my drum shop in New Jersey. It was called talking drum. And it seemed like it was from a, a guy in the Baltimore area. I, I assume Baltimore, Washington, DC area. Cause he always went to this blues alley club. I think it was in Baltimore and he would take pictures and he would interview the drummers and he was really into gear. So he always took lots of shots of the drums and talked a lot about the equipment and you know, talking about drum equipment was a big deal. My wife used to, you know, whenever she did an article for Modern Drummer, you had to talk to the drummer about what equipment they used. It was a big, a big, because you have to, <laughs> you have to. And plus the drum companies expected it because, okay, they want to sell their products. So if you're, if you're a Yamaha endorser, you better talk about Yamaha drums. If you're a Zildjian cymbal player, you better talk about Zildjians, you know? Yeah. So it was a very important part of the article was to get the equipment in you know, for the, their endorsements, you know, and this guy was really big on the picture side of it. And that was one of the things that was always great. When you found good pictures, you didn't always get great pictures. Now there was a, a, a photojournalist for modern drummer, Lisa Wales, who's famous. She, um, oh, she yeah. died of cancer years ago, but yeah. um, she was one of the rock journalists that used to really get some great photos of, of the drum kits and stuff. But yeah. I'm sure there were a few other guys. I don't remember all the names of the people. No, of but course. You, you but you were really looking for that. Talking drum, though, I remember you holding it up in the video. It was black and white, correct? The photos. Yeah, all the photos were black and white, and they never were able to move it to color. They got color expensive. on the front. Oh, it was expensive, yeah. yeah. I mean, I there's a, a magazine that I started subscribed to from the recording end, because I know you're a recording person. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you had this magazine. It's a magazine called Tape Op. 
I don't know if you ever heard of. Tape I've seen it. They we used to have at the studio I used to work at stacks of magazines that you'd kind of thumb through from going back to the '80s, and that was one. And Mix Magazine and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, Tape Op started in like right around the end of the '90s, and the owner of Tape Op didn't sell the magazine; he gave it away. It was all on advertisers, you know, to, to produce the magazine. Hmm. I was I got into that around the, the second or third year of Tape Op. I, I've got I still get Tape Op. They still send them to me. But they were black and white forever until they got enough advertising revenue to go, you know, color. And now mm. they're color. They've got color in there. But it's expensive to go color. That's a big part of this whole thing is how are you yeah. going to produce your magazine? What's it going to look like? Is it going to be gloss finish, flat finish, you know, all that stuff. So I think with talking drum and with modern drummer and drums and drumming, all of these, you got to kind of remember, too, um, that it's important that this is like each magazine almost has like its own little like ecosystem around it. And it makes me think of like, um, you know, if we if you look at modern drummer, or if you look at modern drummer, or if you look at any of these, like there's a bunch of journalists who work there. There's photographers who work there. There's advertising people who work there like it supports a lot of people's lives to have a functioning magazine, but it takes a lot of people with different skill sets who want to be using that skill set for a drum magazine. Yeah, and what you ended up having in all these magazines is an editor, publisher, and then a very skeleton crew of the the real team that was getting paid. And the rest were all freelance. Like my wife was a freelance journalist. Mm. So the freelance journalists have to write for other magazines. And there must be some exclusivity to like, you know, if you're writing for MD, you can't be writing for drum. I'm sure there was that. My wife never tried that. But you could write for other music journalists, journalism magazines like maybe Rolling Stone or Guitar Player or something else. You could go in a different genre and be okay to to cross over. Like my wife was writing for a Christian magazine, so that was a a different thing, you know? Yeah. Um, But yeah, you're right. It is an ecosystem. And, you know, the people that are in running the magazine at different times, you can see their stylistic journey for the magazine, you know? First, Ron Spagnardi, and then, you know, he brought in certain editors like Rick Van Horn and um, Rick Mattingly, and then eventually Bill Miller. And then after Bill Miller passed away, um, I I lost track of who was running it. Um, I forget the name of the guy who was running it. Basically, you know, they put their their slant on it. That's what always happens. You know, whoever's running the magazine, that's what happens. And I think one of the interesting control issues, that's a control issue, who's in power at the magazine, right? We're talking about Um, one of the interesting magazines uh, stories that I've learned um, from the other side of it was Drumhead because Jonathan Mover was working for a publisher who was backing the magazine early on. And then that guy started going a different direction. And Jonathan tells the story. So you have to listen to Jonathan's story on it, but he's going a different direction. And Jonathan goes, I want to buy the magazine from you and I want to run it my way because I'm, I'm doing all the work. Anyhow, I'm going to find a different way to back this and go a different direction. And he did. And he kept the integrity of the magazine intact the whole time that it was being produced. Matter of fact, their last issue was the same time MD ended for me. It's kind of funny. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I got the Steve Gadd Gadamans issue of Drumhead, and I've never seen another issue after that. And I still have issues left in my subscription. Try a free 30-day trial of Drumeo by heading to the link in the description of this episode. From beginners to pros, Drumeo has something for everyone. Help support drum history and get a free 30-day trial by clicking the link. That whole thing of it just of these magazines kind of just ending or being online only, it's it seems like just the the people's tastes of the way they like to ingest their information has gone more, you know, I don't even want to say digital print PDFs. I mean, really, it's like videos, audio. It's it's just a different uh, world now. I think podcasts have replaced the need for reading an interview. You know, like your podcast has replaced the need to read about John Robinson talking about drums to being transcribed by a writer into a magazine. You know, and yeah. I think that when I go looking for, oh, I want to hear an interview on a drummer, I'm going to go search the drummer's name and I'm going to see if it's on a podcast or if it's on a YouTube video. And yeah. it's kind of interesting that like I interviewed John Robinson. There's a story to that. Yeah. I mean, I took a lesson from him and oh, that, that's awesome. that lesson turned into 
him going, how do you make drumless tracks? Is there a way to do that? I said, yeah, I do that. Cause he heard <laughs> me play something. I, I sent him a video of me playing one of his songs and he says to me, he goes, he goes, how did you, how'd you take the drums off of back in the high life? I said, well, I got this program. I started explaining it to him. He goes, can you do that for me? I said, yeah, sure. He goes, can you do it for like five, six songs? Like, yeah. What would you charge me? I'm like, well, give me another lesson and do an interview with me. That's I've, awesome. You know, that, that's how that worked, you know? That's awesome. Yeah. And he's a great guy and I learned a lot and I got to ask the questions I always wanted to ask. Cause I've always wanted to sit there and ask these kind of questions. Like, well, what makes you, who, who are the bass players you worked with and how did you work with them on this song? How did you work with them on that song? I wanted to ask some hmm. of those kind of crazy questions. Cause that's what I was looking for in an article in modern drummer or an article in drum or an article in drum. Head. I was trying to figure out like what makes this guy tick, you sure. know? Well, you would have enough experience from reading all of these to know what you're looking for because you've got so much uh, background in reading other people's work. You know, you're perfect for it. And, you know, that's the thing that lacks a lot of times in interviewers on the Internet, from my experience, is that guys don't do the research you've done. You do a lot of research, I can tell. Yeah. You know, just the research you did for this. And I'm just me you know <laughs> so i mean <laughs> well, so. <laughs> you're not just you and i i think i mentioned at the beginning but your youtube channel and you're a phenomenal player to stick out and you know kind of float to the top in youtube is harder i think than anything else because there's so many people but you have to be on there that's where everyone is and i think you're killing it well i thank you i appreciate you taking a look too at some of the things totally. i've done um, and I think YouTube's a whole nother, there's a whole nother two sides of YouTube now, of course. There's the production team side of YouTube, where you got a lot of guys doing that. And then you got the YouTubers, like the ones who started the, the whole thing. Like Drumeo started in his, his basement, you know what I mean? Or wherever. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he turned it into something, but he was ahead of the game. There was a head of the curve right there. You know, the 2007, 2008 of YouTube, nobody knew what YouTube was. Yeah. I start, I joined YouTube 2006, it tells me. I didn't post a video until 2011 when I got a sure. camera phone on a phone, you know, <laughs> and I didn't really post a video on YouTube until 2016 when I started to realize that, Hey, I better do this. And I have this studio capability. I've been doing, I've had a recording studio since 1999. Yeah. So I knew the audio side. How do you do the video? I had to learn that. So we yeah. have to continue to morph that. That's, that's the reality of it. And that's the same, the reality for publishing. You know what I mean? They have to morph. So yeah, where are we going to go to? I mean, but I think the other side of it, though, that's kind of missed is like the uh, f besides physically holding something, you know what I mean? Like, it's cool to like, you know, you're on a beach or you're on an airplane or you're in your family room, wherever you're 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 changing. You're flipping a page. It's awesome. Uh, and it, it it holds your attention. And that's the only thing you're doing, as opposed to like listening to us right now talking about this. Someone's probably walking their dog or doing their dishes or doing something. Else, you know what I mean? Like you can yeah. do other other stuff. But it's also very like uh, curated where like, here's this article, here's this article where um, I mean, it's a great thing. But again, to use us an example as an example, they're going to get this one, you know, hour ish interview for this week. But with a magazine, you get so many different articles. I like the ads. You get cool pictures. You get all these different a variety of things. That's sort of what's missing from you know, one YouTube video or one podcast episode. You bring a, a great point. And matter of fact, I look forward to the magazine having ads in it. I do too. Where I hate ads on YouTube. <laughs> it's like, and I feel bad when I put ads on my monetized videos, the yeah. stuff that I create, yeah. you know, because you, ha you have to, because that's, there's a couple, you can make a couple cents on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I make a few hundred dollars from Google each year. Well, thank you, Google. You know, thank you for yeah. giving me a little bit of something back, you know, but it, it it's a tough world to monetize. I mean, I don't know how the music industry is surviving, you know, and truth of the matter is, why do you need a record label today? That's another question you can ask yourself. You know, I'm sure that'd be a great podcast topic. So someday. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, would now be a good time to talk about the drum size stuff? Yeah, let's talk about that. That because that's that was what got me to to do that YouTube video. I was listening to your Power Tom podcast yep. with and Kyle got, Schneider. Yep, right. He was and he was a great guy, but I thought he just didn't take it back as far as I knew it goes back because drum size has been something that the drum industry had been dealing with in the seventies and the sixties. I mean, if you really go back to the forties and fifties and look at drum kits, 
I mean, it wasn't always a four piece kit. I mean, and some of the odd sizes we have today, like going back to Slingerland, I'm, I'm just going to show you something I know. You know, Slingerland had this traveling kit with the strangest drum sizes. It was a 14 by 20 bass drum. That was a standard. It had a 9 by 13, and I think it had a 16 by 16, no bottom heads. So there were concert toms. And the 10 inch tom, they had a 10 inch tom attached to it, which was a 9 by 10. That's an oddball size. That wasn't in any catalogs except yeah. Slingerland made this one kit that would kind of like nest together, I think. You could put them together and then we're take them to a gig hmm. and they only made them in the early 70s late 60s early 70s then they were gone so i didn't even see them until i found out later when i started getting like all my catalogs on pdf which i have a whole slew of catalogs on pdf and i went back i said what is this kit and then i started seeing them on on ebay and i was like oh <laughs> wow so that's Pretty a cool. nine by that's a nine by ten there was no nine by ten in the 70s catalogs of ludwig or slingerland that i could find except for for concert toms Huh. It was there, so that was a power size. So I'm thinking the sizes of the drums go back further, and that's what inspired me to go. Let me let me do this YouTube thing on these drum magazines, and let's touch on this thing about sizes. Here's the thing: Modern Drummer being an American magazine, having Slingerland, Gretsch, Ludwig, and Rogers as their main first advertisers in the magazine. They were the first ones because Tama was just starting to come up. Yamaha really doesn't break forward until the 80s in the in advertising world. They start advertising heavily. You know, the recording custom kit becomes something Steve Gadd is their endorser in 77. So the Japanese companies embrace the sizing of the American drum companies to the T. Everything is shell, you know, 8 by 12, 8 inch depth shell, 12 inch head tom. Yeah. Everything's that way. But in actuality, if you go back to the UK, you go look at a sonar catalog from Germany, or you look at a premier catalog from the UK, they were backwards. They were actually doing the head first and then the, dia the, the depth of the shell. So it mm. is a European thing to do that. Well, the first time we started to see the real controversy of it is Drum Magazine. Drum said, we're going to differentiate ourselves. And I don't know if this was a conscious decision but it definitely was something that said, we're going to draw the line here and we're going to say, we're going to do it this way. And that was became like this, like every time I see something in drum, I'd go, Hey, that's the wrong. They're not using the right sizes. And it was really super confusing with power toms. Cause when you had square size power toms, what are, what, what are we talking about? I mean, 14 by 14, is that 14 head, 14 shell diameter, or is it yeah. Shell diameter head, you know, which, which yeah. one is it? You know, I mean, snares are kind of obvious if it's like a five by 14, it's like or five and a half by 14. That's pretty obvious what that is. But when you get to Tom's, it's like, is it eight by 10 or is it 10 by eight? And it's like it, where, where, where the times it happens where it could go either way. It's just like and you need to see a picture. It's sort of it gets a little uh, confusing. It gets crazy. And I think drum really was the magazine that kind of flipped it. So put them both against. Now, they could have had a European influence. And I mean, I'm not saying in Europe they weren't having magazines using that sizing system. They probably did. Matter of fact, it was my European YouTube subscribers that said, wait a second, you're wrong about this. They, it was the Premier catalog. They used the same sizing that we're, we're you're talking about or the Sonar catalog. And I went, I looked at the Sonar, and I said, yeah, you're right. Because I have a Premier catalog from the 70s. I got a Sonar catalog from the 70s. So, so clarify real quick. Europe was doing depth by diameter. They were Correct. going eight by twelve is American. That's yep. depth by diameter of the head. Europe was doing head diameter, so okay. be four, uh, twelve by eight. Well, okay, <laughs> twelve by okay. eight versus eight by twelve, which confuses. Even the talking about it right now is confusing. It's, it's confusing. <laughs> I know it's very confusing. Twelve by eight. That would be a European sizing. For Germany, for Sonar, for Premier, but the Japanese said, "No, we're going to stay with the American." That's the, that's the way because they they were making the stencil kits. Like you, I, I love the stencil kit podcast too. That oh was yeah, one of my Mark favorites. Patch, that was a good one. That was great, and they Thank were you. using American sizing. You know, it was American sizing on that because they were selling those kits like to Americans. Tons of those kits. Those kits, they were the drum kits that I 
saw when I was a kid. I wanted one of those. I wanted one out of the Sears catalog, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's interesting that the history of that does come back to a magazine, which of course it does, because that's what everyone was like reading. And that's what that's what everyone that's that's where everyone was getting their information, you know, yeah. and that's the tastemaker kind of thing where uh, it spreads from there to the streets. And actually, I think they were starting to sneak it into drums and drumming before it went under because drums and drumming pulled the plug, you know, and then all mm. of a sudden it becomes drum. And I didn't realize it, but I think some of the latter issues of drums and drumming it, it was gone. But when I went into Rhythm Magazine, with the one that was UK based, they were using mostly traditional American sizing. But every once in a while, I guess if the author was from the UK, they might flip it around. So th that's where the fuzziness started to happen. Okay. But for me, it was never fuzzy. It was always like, look at look at a drum catalog. Look at it. Look at Yamaha's catalog. It's eight by twelve. You know, it's it's got to be that. That's the right way to do it. Yeah. But now it's it's a little fuzzy. It's fuzzy now. And you know what? One of the interesting thing is the Europeans didn't change the inches to centimeters. You know, even if you look at Sabian cymbals, I, I, I used to play a lot of Sabian cymbals back in the day. Um, it was the first cymbals I could really afford to buy a full set of at one point. And they had centimeters on it. We never went to 51 centimeters for a 20 inch ride cymbal or 19 inch yeah. ride cymbal, whatever it was. We stayed in inches because the United States influence on. An Amer matter of fact, the drum kit is truly an American instrument. Sure. You know, you, there's no denying that it came from the United States. It went through the jazz drummers, William F. Ludwig's, you know, building the first bass drum pedal, you know, all that stuff brings it this to a clearly an American instrument. Even the Europeans will concede to that one. Yeah. So staying in that sizing makes sense to me, but that's where the confusion came in. <laughs> so in my yeah. book. Okay. Well, that clarifies the confusion. Uh, it's still confusing when you look at different things, but I think that cl clarifies where the confusion comes from. So, all right, there's some, there's a couple more drum magazines on the list, correct? Yeah. Um, well, drum magazine. Now, drum magazine is California based, got the punk drummers in it. They're basically doing that thing. A lot of rock drummers, a lot of punk drummers, you know, um, they're doing the van tours, you know, the, uh, yep. I, mean, I remember my, my son was big into wanting to go the see those, tour. the warp tour. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, Vans warp tour, you know, yeah. they're, they're big on that stuff. And then all of a sudden they're realizing, well, we're not getting certain readers that MD's getting, they got the classic traditional boomer, you know, studio drummer guys. So they put out a magazine called traps and they tried it and it was quarterly at first. And I think it stayed quarterly. I don't think it ever got past quarterly. And they put some classic drummers on it, like Tony Williams, um, I think John Bonham might have been on it. One of them, uh, Steve Gadd was on it. I think he was on the last one, I believe. Um, so that yeah. was kind of a an interesting magazine, and that was them going to more long form journalism, longer articles, more in depth analysis of the the albums they played on, the drum kits they used, and about their career. You know, it was and it was it was more that kind of thing. That's interesting. It seems like with traps and um, modern percussionist, like you almost have to have it all in one magazine like traps. It's getting a little too narrow. You know what I mean? Like, it seems like you have to kind of balance uh, the main magazine to accommodate everyone as opposed to having one super specific enthusiast beyond enthusiast kind of magazine. Yeah. And I think what's what drove that was drumhead entering the market. Because I think probably what happened was at one of those NAMM shows, they started hearing about, oh, there's another magazine coming and it's going to have that niche. And that's where Drumhead took, that was their sweet spot. They went, they jumped right in. They saw Modern Drummer starting to write smaller, shorter articles going for the punk rock drummers and trying to add more of the, you know, more of the rock drummers in, more of the progressive drummers, more of the, less of the boomer drummers, more of the Xer millennial drummers okay I, I i'm only delineating for the reason of you see there's a change going on here sure and all of a sudden drumhead comes in and goes we're gonna we're gonna keep writing to these boomers because you know they buy they're buying a lot of gear still at this point in time yeah so we can get somebody to back us from an advertising dollar probably and they jumped in and i think that word of that got to these guys and drum and they said let's try traps and they tried to go against it but Drumhead actually succeeded. 
Mm-hmm. And I, th- I thought that I thought they had a great run. You know, I mean, it's a shame they went under too, but I'm sure COVID didn't help. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> COVID, that's a whole. COVID, that's another topic. I know. That's a whole other topic. Um, that whole thing is just got to be. It's brutal for any business, but especially just print magazines. And it's almost like uh, the nail in the coffin of, of something that was just going kind of slowly going away. It's it perpetuated this just like drop off, you know? Yeah. I, and I think that might have been the nails, unfortunately, was COVID. Because, yeah. you know, Drumhead died pretty it just happened. Like you got an issue and they're planning another issue and then they're not here anymore. Yeah. And the same thing happened with MD. It was like, can't get the issue. Now MD is still around in a digital format, but getting a print version of it's not there. And so I'll leave that alone. (laughs) It is what it is. I think the last, I mean, I had an MD subscription until it just sort of, like you said, stopped showing up. Um, But I think the last magazine I got, was um from people I worked with you know it was my birthday and they went someone ran to Barnes and Noble or whatever and got me a drumhead magazine I think it had Gavin Harrison on it um and it was great it was awesome it's just like it's so cool it's just like a physical thing you hold but um I think that was the last one besides I probably had an MD show up here and there um after that but that was the last drumhead I got I, I always love to go to like I feel like Barnes and Noble or where Borders wherever there's always that kind of specialty magazine section with cars and like there'd be like the gun magazines and then the guitar and then the drums so yeah. cool so cool to pick one up and it's a shame that those places borders went first. And I think Barnes and Nobles is still there. Yeah. I had a good friend of mine. We were talking, he saw my YouTube um, video. He's not a drummer, but he saw it because he watches a lot of YouTube. And he said, I was in Barnes and Nobles and I went to see if you're tr- telling the truth. He goes, I'm going to see if you're telling the truth. There's no more drum magazines. So he asked them, he said, yeah, there's no drum magazines. They're all gone. So there's still a guitar player apparently, or some kind of guitar magazine, like maybe vintage guitar or something like that but yeah where should we go from here should we are there less are there other magazines we should talk about yeah let's talk about a couple and a couple that how they dropped off too all right um there was a in 2000s there was a couple magazines that kind of came into being um one of them was a a magazine called vintage drummer that kind of rather quickly became classic drummer and Classic Drummer, again, was in that same space of the Boomer. I think it was run by a Boomer. Um, first, they were going for the vintage, trying to like be on the not-so-modern drummer kind of side of vintage drums, but then realized Classic Drummer articles were, were cool. So they had guys like Danny Serafin, Carmen Apice. Um, they even found other guys that never got a shot in Modern Drummer. Like there, I remember seeing one of these guys who played with Kenny Logan, uh, you know, Kenny um, Rogers in the first edition. Forget the guy's mm-hmm. name, but he played on some records and stuff. Um, so they were going for like that niche of these drummers that were, I guess, favorites of this. The guy who owned, owned the magazine, you know what I mean? But they quickly went from print in about 2011, 12, and jumped into a total digital format right there. And it was like they saw the writing on the, the wall. They weren't going to be able to sell enough magazines. They went digital. They went PDF. They didn't care. Yeah, they made it They made it free. They made mm. it free. Wow. And I, I had it until they stopped making them. You know, I, I had it. As soon as they went free, it was like they just wanted to get some advert. You know, and that's the thing about advertising. I don't know if – I actually had a season in the – the end of the 2000s to 2015 because I had a recording studio. I have a, my studio name is Sanctuary Sound. Now it's really a private studio. I was trying to be public at one point, but I couldn't make a business of being a recording en- engineer. That is hard. Yeah, you yeah. know that. You yeah. know what that's all about. So I had it listed as Sanctuary Sound. So Tape Op comes to Sanctuary Sound at my address. I started getting magazines from Mix Magazine for free, EQ for free. You know, they just. Would sit, like I got on their magazine list and they said, oh, this is a recording studio. We're going to send it to you. They want it to be on the coffee table. So people are thumbing through it when they're yeah, sitting around exactly. recording. Yeah. yeah. They didn't realize it was going on my coffee table and <laughs> <laughs> I'd sit there and yeah, thumb through one, it. One guy, but you buy gear, you know, whatever. Yeah. Well, I was I, and I was subscribing to Sound on Sound, you know, which yeah. is probably the, the best audio magazine there was at the time. 
Yeah, and I still sure. think it's around. And they saw the model too. That was about 2013, 14. They said, we're going to have a print magazine and a digital. And they made it appealing price-wise to get both. Mm-hmm. And I went both. I had an iPad. I went both. I was flying on planes. I could download it. That If you're going to go digital, you've got to make it appealing where you can put it on a device yes. and you can store it. Because if you can't store it, it's useless. And it's cool how some of them have like interactive stuff where click here and you know, then a video plays or there's like, you know, uh, it's it, it lets you do stuff and, and zoom in on the kit and stuff like that. But that's development. That's expensive. This whole thing is like to be a smaller magazine. It's like that's tough. It's a lot of development. Matter of fact, the coolest uh, um, the coolest iPad book there is. I don't know if you know about this book or not. Peter Erskine wrote a book. No Beethoven, it's called. It was written, I think, in 2012, 13, 14 ish, somewhere in that range. I, I just got an iPad in 2012. So I bought the I bought it. It was a gig, a gig of space on a 16 gig iPad. Okay. Wow. <laughs> but I bought it. I still have it on my iPad today, which has got a lot more space now. But that original iPad, I ha- I bought it and I read it in I was traveling a lot, a lot of a lot of hotel nights. It was the coolest book because it was all audiovisual. There was clips in it. There was playing performances. There were photos and photos and photos. And it was wow. one gig of space to, to, to download this book. But yeah. it is one of the earliest multimedia book experiences that I've ever seen. And it's all based on Peter Erskine's life and his time with Weather Report and Steps That's Ahead awesome. and all that stuff. It's, it's a great book. Of course, not many people had the iPad space to handle it at that point. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I That's think cool, you can still get it though. But that, cool. that and I mean, if you're going to go to a magazine format, you've got to have, it's got to be able to have both. If you want to have those, those examples, that's great in a digital format, but it's also got to be something where you can get your, it in your hand and you feel like you can read it on a plane. And I remember mm-hmm. I used to fi- I used to call modern drummer back in the, mid 2000s before the new owner was there okay they were putting out pdfs and i would get a pdf i get an email link and i get a pdf and i download it and i have a whole bunch of them saved that i still have on my ipads because when i fly on a plane i don't have any magazines anymore so i still got all those old modern drummer pdfs that That's i have awesome. and i thumb through them and i i will do i will read on an ipad when i'm on a plane because there's nothing else to read you know sure. but um Truthfully, if you can't get a PDF where you can get thumb through it, it's not really going to work. And a PDF, yeah. the PDF, iPad doesn't work at the beach, unfortunately. I tried it. I try it on my phone or on it, phone never works. It's too small. Yeah. So you got to have Sun's an iPad or tablet. It's too bright, you yeah. know. So that's where the magazine, that feeling in your hand, means something. You know what I yep. mean? And then that you get home and the magazine is like crumpled and it's like been wet in certain corners and that yeah. that's like. That is a well-read magazine. <laughs> and I've got 45 years of Modern Drummer magazine like that. That's are all <laughs> That's awesome. You know, all over the place. Yeah. I also want to mention Tom Tom magazine, which is a really cool uh female dedicated drum magazine. I've reached out to him before, but I got to follow up. Um I'd love to do a episode all about them. So, any other magazines we should talk about that that didn't make it through as we uh you know, get closer to the end here. I think we hit all the ones I really covered in that YouTube video. You know, so we hit everything pretty much. Now, were there others? There could have been others, you know, that, that could have tried. I, and there were a few minor ones I kind of brought into that. But I don't think they're the made. They're not the majors. The, the, we talked about all the majors. Yeah. And there's like regional. I feel like there's like a difference between like a magazine and like what people refer to as like a zine where it's like more of like a DIY type, which is popular. And like my brother is in the art world and does stuff with that, where it's like more of a DIY self-printed magazine. I guarantee you there's lots of those that maybe uh, if people know about, they can comment below and um, tell us about, because I'm sure Earl would want to know that and maybe get his hands on them because it seems yeah. like you love that kind of stuff. So um, and then beyond in other countries, like Earl said at the beginning, in that world there's too many for us to even begin to mention and and we don't know about ones that might be in uh, the country you live in that you're listening to right now um but again comment and let us know on social media or youtube wherever you're listening to this um 
some of the cool magazines that you enjoy now or you grew up with or anything like that. Um, last question for you, Earl. What were the articles basically that your your wife was writing for Modern Drummer? Is she a drummer? Well, my wife married a drummer. <laughs> and I will say this about a wife that marries a drummer. We're married almost 40 years. It'll be 40 years in March. Um, one of her things was she wanted to get into my headspace because she knew that that's what I was, was a drummer. She never yeah. wanted me to not be a drummer. I mean, now when we, my son was born, there was this one point where I thought like, well, I got to get a job at a gas station. And she goes, no, you need to get a gig. You don't need a job at a gas station. You need to keep playing drums. Cool. And she encouraged me to find an, a wedding gig that I, you know, and I did get a wedding gig and then we got a wedding gig together and she got in the show with me. And so we, we, she's an artist. I'm an artist. She's a songwriter. Um, so that was really the connection. She learned drums because she was also a writer. She learned it so that she could be in my world. That was part of it. The articles that she wrote, she was the, she was the one that queried Modern Drummer for the first Christian drummer article on CCM Music. This was before okay. CCM Music was really anything known by everybody. Um, everybody knows Amy Grant. She just got some Kennedy Center Award this week, I think. Hmm. So she's, um, she's huge. Amy Grant's huge. Well, Amy Grant was just beginning in the late 70s, early 80s, and she was starting to take off. And CCM music was starting to take off on the back of an Amy Grant. There were other CCM artists, a lot of CCM artists in the 70s and 80s that most people don't know about unless you were really a dedicated Christian living in the church world. But um, Amy Grant kind of took it to the masses. And then all of a sudden you would have your Michael W. Smiths, your DC Talks, and it would just keep going to where it's at today where everybody it's knows huge. about it. It's huge. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's a genre unto itself. But she wrote the first Christian drummer article. It was two parts, um, and the interesting thing was the drummers that were in the article, I had some say in who she chose, so, <laughs> you know, because yeah. they were You're drummers. The drummer. Yeah, th these were bands I liked, so I picked the yeah. drummers I liked, you know. I will say my one regret was we got a, an album by this band called Whiteheart, and I didn't know Whiteheart at the time, and... Um, Unfortunately, it came in. It was just a little late in getting there. She was already picked her six drummers. One of them I didn't agree with, but she just had an easy, it was an easy, we, we saw a concert and she talked to the guy. Yeah. But the drummer for Whiteheart was a guy named um, Chris McHugh. <laughs> so Chris McHugh is the drummer I wish she'd interviewed for that yeah. article because he yeah. became huge. He's a totally. huge drummer, you know. Um, but she ended up interviewing guys, um, you know, the first group of guys, probably nobody knows them except guys that followed Christian music. Then she would end up interviewing Greg Morrow, who's played with the Dixie Chicks and James Taylor, but also played with Amy Grant. She interviewed two guys that were session drummers in Nashville. One of them, a guy named John Hammond, famous session drummer. He plays with Amy Grant too. He's another guy who plays. Mm. We wasn't playing with Amy Grant at the time. He played on an album I played on. I played on an album in Nashville in 87 and I got replaced by John Hammond. So Wow. It's an honor. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was an honor to get replaced by John Hammond. Yeah. It was also an interesting, I, I remember walking him out to the car with his cymbals and saying to him, saying, you know, John, um, my wife writes for Modern Drummer. I'm going to see if I can get you in Modern Drummer. And he must have thought I was crazy. He must have really, like, I just replaced wow. this poor drummer. I just replaced this poor drummer, and he's going to try to get me to Modern Drummer. That's crazy. You never know. That's why you got to be nice to people in general. You just never know who who, who knows who and what's going to lead to what. And uh, that's a testament to, to you, uh, which I have learned from looking at your YouTube. And, and Stephanie, your wife, I was looking at her YouTube channel as well. You're both very just nice, uh, friendly people. And I think that came across in this uh very strongly well thank you i and i think that's what's important in life is being nice to people yeah i think totally. the world needs a lot more nice people you're a nice person too so <laughs> that's what you. comes that that comes across all the time the way you treat all your guests so oh, i appreciate it earl as we're kind of finishing up here why don't you tell people about your youtube channel and where they can find you and any anywhere else they want uh, you want to direct them uh i have a youtube channel it's under earl bennett earl drum i play a lot of drum covers i have a show called ask earl anything and people ask me crazy drum questions about what symbols to use and what sticks to buy and why do you play this way or why do you do that 
Um, it's been going on for about six years. So I've got a, I got a pretty good subscriber base, like yeah, almost 7,000. So I'm getting close. Awesome. I will put a link in the description for Earl's, um, channel and all that good stuff. Uh, again, check out, uh, vintage drum history.com. That's Mark Cooper's new website. Um, on that note, Earl, thank you for doing the work and, and, uh, you know, you did all the work on your YouTube channel and I just kind of plucked you and said, Hey, can you do this on my show? And I think you killed it. So, um, thank you for being here and sharing your knowledge. Well, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it and keep doing the great work you're doing. Cause I, I love your show. So awesome. Thank you, Earl.